Good afternoon and welcome to a special Dean's Circle edition of the Scope podcast. I'm Nicole Wadsworth, Dean of the New York Institute of Technology College of Osteopathic Medicine. It is my sincere pleasure to be on location at Shady Farm, New York, to speak with Dr. Jerry Ballantyne, who has graciously invited us to the farm. Today, our conversation with Dr. Ballantyne will focus on his extraordinary medical career and unique life experience, including how his interest in medicine began, highlights from his dynamic medical career, visits from Tallulah, his dog, his transition from working in the fast-paced clinical environment of emergency medicine to becoming a senior executive at New York Institute of Technology and the establishment and growth of a working farm in Woodstock, New York, Shady Farm. Thank you, Dr. Ballantyne, for opening your home to us today. We're extremely pleased to visit you on your farm. You're welcome. Before we delve into the conversation, I would like to provide our listeners with a few highlights from your outstanding medical career. Board certified physician in emergency medicine, Dr. Ballantyne served as chief medical officer and executive vice president of St. Barnabas Hospital and Healthcare System in the Bronx, New York. Prior to joining New York Tech as vice president for medical affairs and global health in 2014, Dr. Ballantyne has held numerous other positions throughout his career including hospital medical director, emergency department director, and residency program director. Dr. Ballantyne is currently serving as the senior vice president, chief operating officer, and interim provost at NYIT. Dr. Ballantyne has been an adjunct fac faculty member at NYIT College of Osteopathic Medicine for more than 20 years. In 2009, he was appointed uh, chief of the emergency medicine division within the Department of Clinical Specialties and was appointed a faculty associate in the Center for Global Health. Dr. Ballantyne has authored and edited many web and textbook chapters and was medical editor of the New York Medical Journal. He is also a medical author and editor for WebMD Network. Dr. Ballantyne's research interests throughout his career has centered on the patient and student experience. His current area of focus are on non-academic interventions with medical students to help them increase empathy and decrease burnout. Esports and the role medical providers play in preventing chronic and acute injuries. In the past few years, Dr. Ballantyne and his wife, Victoria Ballantyne, have established the beautiful Shady Farm in New York a growing farm in upstate New York that has joyfully houses a robust group of animals. You've already seen Tallulah, also including goats, chickens, and his dedicated herding dogs. The farm also has a robust vegetable garden, offers goat yoga sessions, check it out on the website, and delicious goat cheese and yogurts, fresh eggs and vegetables. Wow, Dr. Ballantyne, I'm kind of tired just talking about all that's just amazing. So, um, so let's sort of let's kick off into the interview, and can you share with us a little bit about your background and training in healthcare and how your interest in medicine began? Well, my interest in medicine really began because uh, my dad always wanted to be a physician. Uh, growing up in Alabama, relatively poor he was not able to afford to even go to college. So ever since I was a little boy, he would say to me, oh, Jerry, you're gonna be a doctor. So in many ways, I had no choice. I actually had other fields that I would have preferred to go into, but uh, you know, when your dad tells you that every single day of the week, you do it for your dad. So that's how I got interested in it. And then it turned out to be just a perfect field for me and for my interests. Wonderful. So one of the big focuses at NYTCOM is really wellness. And we spend a lot of time and energy on helping students appreciate that and understand the importance to their career. So I'm curious, how did you incorporate personal wellness throughout your medical career, particularly as you were practicing as a physician? 
I would say I went through different phases. So when I became a resident, as you know, that's an incredible stressful time because you really have very little control over your schedule and all your time. And at the same time, you're for the first time responsible for patients. And you see a lot of, I trained at a level one trauma center in emergency medicine. So I saw an immense amount of death and suffering and pain. And I actually started writing. So I would write, you know, when I'd come home, I would just write about my day, whether it was like a short story or poetry or something else. That's how I first got involved in it. And before coming to medical school, uh, I was a lifeguard and there you had to uh, train a lot. So you'd swim every day, you'd run every day. So I had gotten into triathlon, so I used that as a balance to do this physical exercise to kind of exhaust your mind physically, uh, your body physically, while the writing would exhaust my mind uh, in a different way. Um, and then going through it, when I became medical director, I was confronted with a lot of physicians who you know, had alcohol problems, drug problems, and as medical director of the hospital, I was always the one who had to confront them and say to them, hey, we think you have a problem and, and help them. So I slowly got very interested in how you can do this and how you can help other people, other physicians specifically. And it became very clear that the continuum of medical education actually is not interested in helping you, right? So you, you, you get accepted to medical school, and what do you get told in most medical schools? You know, sit down and study and just study. Just study more, study a little bit more. Uh, nobody tells you, oh, go out running or do something for yourself. Then you become a resident and it's even worse. I mean, you remember 100 hours, 120 hours working, people just telling you it's Saturday, you need to come in. And then when you start your own practice, there's a new stress. Now you have a family, you might have babies, you, and you still haven't learned how to deal with stress. So that's why I think the importance is to start on the first day of medical school saying to people, if you're not healthy, if you're not well, if you're not happy, you're not gonna be a great physician. So work on that while you're learning all the other things as well. Thank you for that. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's so critical and being able to start that early in the medical career is, is um, I think really beneficial. I do think sort of like being a parent though, you it won't be appreciated until really down the road. So we'll see what happens. Um, when you made the decision to transition from full-time emergency medicine into the clinical setting, what, what prompted that? I always assumed I would be an emergency medicine physician and became a program, residency program director, which was always my dream. That's what I thought I would do for the rest of my medical career. And then one day, I was sitting with the two people who were the department chair and the vice chair, and I was kind of number three. And the senior vice president for the hospital system stopped by and said, we need somebody to go to Rikers Island and open an emergency department. Uh, we had just, the hospital had just gotten a contract to provide medical care. And as always, the two bosses, you know, said, not us, not us. And they pointed at Jerry and I said, sure, I'll try it. And I went out to Rikers Island, set up first the emergency department there. And then the senior vice president asked me to go down and set up the Manhattan House of Detention, the healthcare there. So I did that. And when I returned, he asked me to become medical director of a hospital. And uh, it seemed interesting. And so I got involved kind of indirectly. I didn't apply for any of the positions. I was just asked to do it. And suddenly I saw that I could really influence physicians' well-being on one hand, but make a real massive influence on our patients, right? If I was able to change staffing patterns or add a cancer center, suddenly I could influence the healthcare of a lot of patients in one of the neediest areas in the country. There was this need to change that, and we could change this because you got residencies involved. So now you had more physicians, more academics, you got more resources. So it was really a fascinating time to work on all of that. So it just really spoke to me. And then you transitioned from the healthcare environment into the academic environment. So what, what brought that change on? I think it was one morning. I woke up one morning and I said to Victoria, I'd love to do something else, just one more different thing. And uh, so we started looking and uh, what really happens is when you start saying to people, I'm thinking about doing something else, they basically come to you and says, oh, why don't you become chief medical officer with us? And I say, no, 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 I, 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 that's, I've done that. I want to do something different. And uh, as the word kind of got out that I was interested in doing something different, I received a phone call. Uh, from actually Dr. Ross Lee saying, look, I'm thinking about retiring and uh, would you be interested in my job? And I told Barbara, I said, look, Barbara, I have no idea what you're doing. I don't know what a vice president for health sciences at NYT is. 
and we had lunch together. I met the president, she walked me around and I got uh, very excited for the job. But also what I really loved was, and that I'm sure Barbara tricked me into this, she had asked me a year earlier to go to Arkansas to look at graduate medical education there, because that was one of the areas I knew a lot about. And I really loved the notion of having a medical school campus in one of the largest urban areas in the world, in New York City, and then one in a really rural area like, uh, like Arkansas. It was really fascinating to me. Thanks for bringing up Barbara. I mean, I, I think maybe one day we should really look at how many lives in the osteopathic world Dr. Rossley has touched. Because Absolutely. It's been many, yeah. many. Well, I'm going to shift gears a little bit sure. and um, move into the farming because you've had these really wonderful transitions in your life, and this is another one. So, so when did your interest in farming really start? Well, it's really not me. It's my wife Victoria. So we. Uh, uh, during one of those transitions, we decided to, to have a house in, in the Catskills, you know, kind of a weekend getaway, a place we could go and forget about everything else. And uh, we had a great time there and we got to know our neighbors and both our neighbors were homesteaders. Different approaches, one basically lived totally off the land, the other one had a business and was homesteading. And Victoria just started watching them and uh, working with them and really fell in love with the notion of producing all your own food, all your own resources. Um, so as she started precepting with them, working with them more and more, I think one morning she just came up to me and said, this is what I'd like to do. And being the good husband, I said, sure, honey. <laughs> and uh, she then uh, started uh, learning even more about it. And we came to the conclusion that where we were living, there was not enough land for us. So uh, we went out and started looking. We were very fortunate. Uh, about, I guess, two years before the pandemic, uh, we sp spotted this place, which is about 50 acres, it was all wooded. So there was no house sites or anything else. And it was a little bit nerve wracking to come on here and try to figure out where the house would be built. But again, Victoria found the spot, put the house in the spot so that during the winter, uh, we get sunlight and a lot of uh, passive solar. And during the summer, we are protected from the sun. Uh, and we just started the process really just around the beginning of the pandemic. We had the house I'd built by then, we had land cleared, and then the pandemic hit. We moved up here full time and just tried to, just worked on the garden first. Then we added the chickens and then the barn and the goats. And by now we have a thriving place that is really run full time by my wife and I kind of go back and forth and most people think I do most of the work because I post a lot on Instagram but it's really Victoria who works 80 hours a week up here. Tell me a little bit more about some of the challenges that you faced. I mean you, you spoke about the pandemic which you know that that's sort of enough said but. <laughs> yeah I, I think the cha challenges were obviously wanting to do it right uh, and just walking through a wooded area and imagining that when you're standing between all these trees, that this is where the house will go. And, and I have a lot of faith in my wife, but sometimes I was like, are you sure that this is where the house should be? And she says, yeah, right here. And this is how it's going to be located. So that was the beginning. Once the house was here and the pandemic hit, then the challenge really became resources. Where do we get what we need? So uh, the garden had been built, but where do we get the seeds? Because they were all selling out. So just really talking to a lot of people, talking to friends, getting people to help us. Uh, the, the chickens I always talk about, they basically, Victoria was on all kinds of websites, uh, just looking if anybody had chickens to sell. And she found this couple that had found some chickens, you know, that fell off the back of a truck, I assume. And uh, we drove over there and just picked up these chickens and then suddenly had to learn what to do with them. You know, so uh, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was challenging. At times it was scary. There was a, an ice storm and I wake up in the middle of the night and the top that had protected the chicken was blown over. So it was gone. So we ran out in the middle of the night in the dark with snow, grabbing one chicken at a time and putting them in the garage so they wouldn't freeze to death. So now we had a garage full of chickens uh, and then getting them, getting them back. And uh, I remember we lost one chicken uh, and I found it finally, brought it in, and Victoria sat for the next two hours holding the chicken under her coat so the chicken could warm up again. So I think that is a challenge. Uh, and then just the challenge of taking care of all the animals to make sure that you, 
you do the right thing for them, that it's not just that they're not just producing milk for you so you can drink milk, but so that they also kind of, for lack of a better word, enjoy giving you the milk. So as you see when you were with us at the barn, it's this, this different relationship uh, that we have with our animals. You do, and they're, they're delightful. Um, and I think you'd have to meet them to truly understand that. So some of the challenges you just shared, what, what are, so, and I hear it a little bit already, but what are some of your accomplishments and joys that you'd want to share? One, it gives me incredible joy to do this, but it also gives me a lot of uh, calmness. You know, when you get up at five in the morning and you're sipping the coffee and you're planning on what you need to do at work work, right? And then you go out to the barn and all the goats are yelling at you, feed me first, me, feed me first, you know, and, and your two dogs are going, how come you're not feeding us? And the chickens are going, our food is low too. And you run around, you do it, and then you change the water and you come back and you realize you forgot to you know, change something or put the electric fence back on, you go back. That kind of helps you settle everything a little bit. And then you can start your day. And uh, Victoria then really takes care of everything during the day. Um, but it's just a really nice balance and it helps you just kind of start your day the right way in a way. Sort of expanding that on a little bit, how has being part of a farm helped you as a person? It calmed me, which I definitely needed <laughs> desperately. Uh, but I, I also get a lot of guidance from Victoria. So she'll, you know, she, she, she kind of knows what needs to be done. So I don't need to think about it. I can be kind of the the farmhand, so to speak. You know, she says, no, it's, for example, tomorrow we're going to change all the water to start warming it, because soon it's going to freeze. I don't need to figure that out. She'll just say, this is what needs to be done. So it gives me that one opportunity where I'm not the one who has to make the decision, where I'm not the one who has to say, no, this is how we're going to go, but where I can just be coming out, changing the waters, have the dog next to me and do it. So it, it helps me in, in that sense. Uh, and it just gives me incredible joy just to sit with the animals. Or you know, we'll have dinner at night, and every item that we're eating, uh, you know, we've grown here or somehow came to us from this land, which is just very fulfilling and very enjoyable and just changes your mindset on so many things. It sounds really satisfying yes. to, to feel like this is the fruits of yeah, your labor. Absolutely. And so... Um, Expanding on that just a little bit more, what other new skills have you have you developed during your time at working on the farm? <laughs> so I, I grew up, and because my dad wanted me to be a doctor, he never would let me do any physical work. So my dad had a small company that always needed help, and he would say, no, no, Jerry, you, you, know, you should not learn this stuff, you're going to be a doctor. So I had no skills whatsoever. I mean, I had medical skills and leadership skills and management skills, but no skills. So every skill. You know, the first time in my life that I actually owned an electric drill is up here. And, you know, reading about it, looking at YouTube videos, making sure you don't penetrate your hand and therefore end your medical career. And then, but the, the fascinating thing is then you learn and you're like, oh, okay, I can do this. I think the, what I'm proudest of is actually my skills to build fences now. So, because we need a lot of fencing. We need fencing for the dogs. We need fencing for the goats. We need fencing for the for the garden and for the for the other items so that the deer don't get in. Uh, that's really a skill that I learned by you know, reading about it, talking to friends, and uh, uh, every fence you see on this property, except one, the really tall one over there that was built during the pandemic by someone else, uh, I built together with Victoria. And that, I think, is, uh, is something that's, to me, very satisfying. Every time I drive by, I look at it and say, oh, it's still standing. I'm a <laughs> fence-building genius. <laughs> Oh, that's great. So, so you shared a little bit about how your day starts here and it kind of grounds you as, as you get ready to take on your duties at school um, as, you, as you work through the morning. But what, what kind of things you like to do after the day is done and all the animals are fed and you've finished that last email? <laughs> 
Well, I, I think what I really love to do is sit where we're sitting right now. So we, Victoria would sit over there, I'll sit here, and we just look out at this beautiful view. The sun has just set, and we just talk about everything and anything, and usually about animals, right? Oh, you know, Minnie didn't eat that much today. We got to check her tomorrow. Or, you know, what's going on with Tallulah? She's laying under there, and she's not moving as much. Uh, so we love doing that. Uh, well, I love doing it. I hope she does too. <laughs> but uh, then the second thing is I really love music. So, uh, and living in Woodstock, where there's like 200 years of a music tradition, uh, there's a place that we like to go to during the summer. It's basically an old barn-like building where there's classical music on Sunday nights. And uh, we love going there and we actually tailgate beforehand. So Victoria will bring her cheese and a little bit of wine and people come over to our truck and just uh, share with us and we talk about it and then we go to the concert. And then I love sitting in the house, listening to music and just looking out at this view and just enjoying myself. So we've spoken a little bit about the different animals, the chickens, the goats, the dogs. Um, do you have any special stories or anything about them that you'd like to share with our audience? A million different <laughs> stories. I think uh, what Victoria would say is that I'm a sucker for all the animals. So <laughs> we have a little... Uh, baby a little goat that was born very small uh, she was born very tiny and her mom therefore rejected her mom said look I'm not gonna waste my time on this goat she's gonna die so she's not getting any of my milk uh, so Victoria and I would actually go to the barn I would hold the goat the, uh, the big goat the mom goat and Victoria would put the baby on her other trying to get some milk out and then we started feeding her so I still hand feed her in the morning and uh, I think you guys saw when I opened the door, she comes out, she follows me, she goes over where her food is, puts her little hoofs on the food, I take it out, I lift her and I feed her. So that's one of my favorite uh, favorite things to do. But you know, all the animals, each one has something something different and exciting and just fun to watch them. You know, even, even the chickens, our rooster, our new rooster is currently trying to really establish himself as a rooster and he's you know, struggling with it as a young boy between all those ladies, but even just watching him is exciting. You talked a little bit about, I think Minnie is Minnie, the yeah. goat that yeah. sort of attached to you. Yeah. Have you had any experiences where your medical career actually played a role in taking care of your animals? Yeah, especially during the deliveries. So we deliver our own baby goats. So this was our first, uh, first time in April. So Victoria and I would be out there and, uh, you know, we would be, we had a couple of ghosts that needed to be resuscitated and it just kind of brings a little bit of memories back. It's different, obviously, but, you know, you establish an airway, you know, you stimulate the goat to see what's going on or even during birth, the, the, the baby's breech, what do we do? So, so I think it does help. Uh, we also treat our own animals. So uh, goats uh, can get pneumonia, goats can get other infections. So we will give them injections of whatever they need to get better. So those are the kind of skills that I had uh, that I could then, you know, I need to figure out where do you actually give a sub-Q injection in a goat, which part of the body, but how to do it, I already knew. So the medical skills are translatable yeah. to another career <laughs> as a farmer. Absolutely. That's great. It's good to know. Um, so one of the unique things of your farm is the goat yoga sessions. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, and this again is all Victoria's doing. So Victoria was uh, had multiple careers as well. And one of her big careers is she opened a number of yoga studios in Manhattan probably about 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, when we came up here uh, and we had the babies and all, one day she said, you know, I think I want to try goat yoga. And so uh, she came up with the whole business plan. Uh, even, you know, how many goats do you need per person? How many people could be there? We went to our property as multiple fields. We looked at different fields. Where could we do it? What do we need? And she put all of this together and we started it last May. And it's been a, a, a big success in the sense that people love coming and doing it. So you, you, I my job doing good yoga is actually to park the car. So I'm, I'm, the, I'm the valet, basically. Uh, and Victoria brings everybody in, tells them about the goats, and then teaches the yoga class. And just watching people, when the little goats come over and jump on their backs or nibble on their hair, it's just fantastic. I've never seen so many people just say, oh my gosh, this was like one of the best days of my life. And it's just really fulfilling. And at the same time, it produces part of our farm 
income and running a farm or wanting to have a farm that is uh, self-sufficient. Speaking of self-sufficient, when we arrived today, um, Victoria did a tour of the of the garden, and it it was it's it looks beautiful now. I can only imagine what it's like in the summer. So, what what kind of things do you grow, and and how does that sustain you for the year? Yeah, and again, I want to make sure Victoria gets all the credit because I'm really just the guy who schleps it into the house. <laughs> <coughs> so she has the plan. So she she has a whole log where everything goes. And it's seasonal planting. So we plant some things very early in the spring that we'll eat in the summer. And then we plant other things that will be really harvested late fall. We bring it into the house. We let it cure there. Then we put in our root cellar. And some of those items we'll eat January, February, March, and April before the next harvest really comes to sustain ourselves through the winter. Now, we obviously also go out to the to the store and buy other things as well. But uh, I would say most of most of the vegetables we eat all year round are really ours. Most of the, if not all of the salads are all year round. And most of the protein is really either something that we trade for with other farmers or we're involved with growing them on other farms. Our farm is a no-kill farm, so we don't kill any of our animals, but obviously protein needs to come from somewhere. So some of our uh, farmers' friends uh, do have animals, animals that, uh, then will be uh, slaughtered and come to us. And you know, we're often involved in that process, especially Victoria will be there uh, just to give us the opportunity that really everything is, is, is kind of a closed loop. Well, Dr. Ballantyne, I just wanna thank you so much for spending the time with us, sharing your really phenomenal career. And, and I think medical career, farmer career, administrator career. Is there any sort of parting comments you'd like to share with us? No, I, I, you know, I started off by saying that my dad wanted me to be a doctor, but I have to say it's one of the best careers ever. And I think, you know, the medical students who are just starting their career or some of us who are towards the end of our careers, it is a really fulfilling field because you can help people. Uh, you can help people in any setting, no matter what happens, you know, whether you're on a cruise ship as the cruise doctor or you work in a busy emergency department in the South Bronx. You're always there, you can always have help people. You have this incredible skill set to just do good. And that's, you know, I think that's a real blessing. So uh, anybody who's in healthcare, I just think is just very fortunate. Well, thank you. And certainly you, you really help epitomize taking care of yourself so that you can take care of others. And, and I really appreciate that in you and that skill. So thank you. Thank you to Victoria for having us here today and sharing all this. And I can't wait for our next conversation. Thank you, Nicole.